morning, Sierra Community Church family. Great to see you guys here this morning. I just want to say happy Father's Day to all you fathers out there. Let's all stand. We're going to worship our great Father in heaven this morning together. Let's stand and worship him.
Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus.
be the position of our hearts, just bowed low before you, God, realizing that you, in your arms, you satisfy, in your arms, you protect. When we bring it to you and we're anxious about nothing and we thank you for all that you've done for us and when we point those things out specifically, not just generally, but say, thank you, Jesus, for giving me a home. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me a bed. Thank you for my family. When we bring that thankful heart, that gratitude, Lord, you say your peace is actively fighting for us. It's actively protecting us. So I pray, Lord, that as we learn about your peace this morning, that we would just get a glimpse into your glory, that we would just be overwhelmed by it, that we would be, it would surpass our understanding, that we would just be blown away by it. Take a moment here in silence, everybody, and just quiet your hearts before the Lord. Just have a seat, get comfortable, and just talk to the Lord. Jesus, for hearing our prayers, for always listening to us and never turning your back on us, even if we run in the opposite direction. We give this morning to you, Lord. May you be glorified in everything we do and everything we say. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. gentleness, fortitude, and tenderness, a father, a leader, and a lifelong teacher, a comforter, and a patient listener, a hero, and a world changer, a gift from God above. Being a father is a high and holy calling. It is not only a blessing, but also a stewardship. Fatherhood is a precious opportunity and a divine responsibility because it is one of the many ways that God watches over all of us. A father is a protector and a provider, a hard worker and a family man, a role model and a faithful friend. And so from all of us to all of you, thank you to the fathers. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Happy Father's Day to all you dads out there. It really, I tell you what, one of the greatest gifts God has given me is uh, being a father. And so I hope that uh, for you dads out there, it's been a blessing as well. But even more than that, we have a heavenly father who watches over every single one of us. And we are eternally grateful for him. Amen. 
Amen. All right, we have a little bit of family business here before we jump into the Word of God together. Coming up here, June 22nd. So real quick, ladies, beach nights starting here. Um, this is something, the ladies have a table in the back, and I would encourage you to go back there and get all the information. They have so much going on this summer. There's this uh, beach nights just to show up or fellowship and hang out, but they also have a beach Bible study going on. They are going to be at the beach a lot, <laughs> Right? Why wouldn't you after the winter we just had? So yes, go to the beach. Now, this is something you do need to sign up for, the Bible study. I believe today is the last day to do that. So you're going to want to, again, go back to the table. They have all the information that you need about that. And uh, again, more things going on other than that. So go see the ladies after the service at the table in the back. Now, every month we try and highlight one of the many missionaries that we support here at Sierra. Everything that you give does not just stay here in the building. It goes out into many parts of the world. And the missionaries that we are uh, highlighting this month, we'd ask that you would just remember to pray for them this month. And it is the Roe family. They are leading a uh, theological training seminary in Salt Lake City, Utah, right in the center of the Mormon town there. And I'll tell you what, just a, a great family that is committed to bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ into not just where they're at, but training people to go out and share the good news. So please remember to pray for them this month. Now, you may have noticed that uh, there are a few more filled seats in here than there were last week, and that's a great thing because we are welcoming almost a hundred crew students and leaders. Now, I, I, and you're probably going to hate this, but uh, you, you guys, would you mind standing up, those of you who are here for crew? Yeah, give them a round of applause. Thank you, guys. I don't do that to embarrass you. I do that because I, we are so blessed every summer to have you guys be a part of our community. And, and this is not something we see as just you guys are coming and, and you've got your thing going down, you know, um, in, at, your, at your spot. But we hope that the churches that you're at, these would be your families for the summer. And that we would encourage and challenge you and to, as, a, as a church family to remember to pray for these students as they go out to their jobs and to their time and there because they are growing in Christ while they're here and sharing Christ in what they're doing. So please remember to pray for them, encourage them. Hey, if you have a business, give them a job. Like there's a lot of things you can do for these guys, but let's just uh, celebrate the time that we have with them together. So... With that, we are going to dismiss our kids to their Sunday school classes. Everybody else, why don't you get up and greet somebody?
good. Let's grab a seat, everybody. It's great to see everybody. Um, yeah, you don't, you don't even want to stop everybody from enjoying the time together, but you guys will be looking at your watches 40 minutes from now asking where the time went. So again, welcome to Sierra Community Church. If you are visiting with us, I hope this turns out to be a, uh, an encouraging time for you in the Word of God together. This is what we do on Sunday mornings, work through the Word of God. We are in a summer series called Keep Tahoe Spiritual, which is really just, we're working back through the nine gifts of the Spirit, traits, whatever you want to call them, fruit of the Spirit that we have in, we see in Galatians chapter 5. Now, we went through Galatians a while back, but we just didn't really spend a lot of time on this section. And so we've gone back here for the summer, and we're really working through these nine fruits of the Spirit. And so we're going to be in these eight verses today, 16 through 23, which is just really an overview of the section. Again, we're looking at the same section each week. But I'll, I'll tell you what, what's happening here is the Apostle Paul is contrasting two very clearly different ways to live. One way is, is led by the Spirit, a life that's led by God and His direction and His Spirit and what that looks like. And the other is one that's led by not the Spirit, by walking in your own ways or being influenced by other things. And I'll tell you what, we're going to look at the third trait or fruit of the Spirit today, which is peace. And when we were, you know, looking at this ahead of time, we're marking our calendar out, we're seeing who's going to preach on what, and I got peace. I'll admit, I thought, oh, this is, this is an easy one. You should never say that <laughs> when you're preparing to teach about something. And I even had a message in the book of John that we went through about a year ago on peace. And I went back through it and I said, ah, this is terrible. What was I thinking? You know, so it's like a re-going back through this idea of peace, which was much more difficult than I originally thought. Because let's be honest, peace is a very intangible thing. It's something that everybody wants but not everybody agrees on what it actually is. And very few people actually find it. I mean, just in, in you know, relatively short history of, of our country here, you go back to the 1960s and you have a very prominent symbol that became the anti-war symbol. Rabbit ears, right? Is that what that is? The peace sign, the peace sign was the peace is all we need and then we won't, you know, we won't need war if we have peace. And so that was the mantra, right? Peace is, is the absence of conflict, the absence of war. A couple decades later, you're in the 1980s, 1990s. Now, I, I, can't, I honestly can't say that I ever watched a Miss Universe pageant, but I do know enough about the Miss Universe pageant that I know the one answer they're supposed to give when they're asked what is most important to them or what would they like to see. World, see you all, you guys, you watching the Miss Universe pageant? World peace. This is what everybody talks about. Uh, in, in the 1980s, late, late 80s, uh, you guys, I don't know, how many of you remember the, the Seinfeld sitcom where uh, Frank Costanza had the uh, Serenity Now skit? You, anybody remember this? This is so Frank has high blood pressure. He goes to his doctor. His doctor gives him a relaxation tape. And he says, The man on the tape tells me whenever I feel like my blood pressure is getting higher, to say this serenity now, serenity now. And as you can see, he, he's screaming it, <laughs> which is not helpful to his blood pressure or anybody else around him. 
<laughs> now, Larry David, one of the writers of Seinfeld, this is a very kind of, you know, if you don't notice this, this is a very underhanded kind of shot at a lot of the 80s, you know, meditation fads that were coming through. And people were doing things like this and expecting that they would experience peace. And it's, so it's a shot at making fun of culture in that way. Now, now, fast forward to today, and we're still asking this question. What is peace? Can I have it? Do I, do I, where can I find it? And I'll tell you, I, I just I did a very quick Google search on this topic. What, what, is, what is peace? And the, the, the top three that came up, first one actually was a women's uh, organization, World Women's Organization, that interviewed this uh, unknown Nepali woman, or at least they didn't give her credit. And to, for her definition of peace, peace, she said this, peace for women means shelter, food, and education for children. Above all, women need security in the home. They need to sleep well in their beds knowing they are safe from violence. Now, if you look at that, that's a very circumstantial definition of peace, free from violence. We want food, shelter, clothing, education. We want these things materially like that. To them, that is their priority for what peace is. The Council of Europe, next one that came up, this is uh, under an organization, uh, human rights organization out of France. Their definition of peace is this, peace means not only the lack of violent conflicts, but also the presence of justice and equity, as well as respect for human rights and for the earth. So you see now that the definition has expanded. It's not just about the material circumstances. Now we're talking about respect. We're talking about justice. And if you look at Webster's definition, of peace, you'll see this. Peace is a state of quiet. Freedom from public disturbance or war, freedom from upsetting thoughts or feelings, harmony in personal relations. So that's a pretty wide spectrum when you're talking about this idea of what peace is. And so it's no wonder people have a hard time finding it. Now, what we're going to talk about today is not coming at peace from a circumstantial perspective, but from the perspective of what does the scripture say about how we experience real peace? And I'll tell you right up front, real peace begins with having peace with God in his son, Jesus. That's where it begins. Only then can you actually experience true peace with yourself. And when you can experience true peace with yourself, you can then share that peace with others. We, we try and come at this a number of different ways. We try to get it from our, for ourselves without God. We try to get it for other people without having it ourselves. And I'm telling you, peace with God brings peace internally with us. And when we have that, then we can share peace with others. So let's look at these eight verses here in Galatians and what Paul says is the life that is led by the Spirit. Verse 16, this is chapter 5 of Galatians. He says, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the Spirit. To the sinful nature. So he's just set up, there's a, there's a conflict going on here, right? There's a, a sinful nature that wants you to live a certain way, and there is the Spirit of God that has a different way for you to live. He continues, he says, they are at conflict with each other, spirit and the flesh. They are at conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before those who live like this, will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is 
no law. Father, as we meditate on your word this morning together, I pray that your spirit would guide us, that, that you would meet us where we're at and that you would draw us to you, Father. We are so grateful that you have sent your spirit and that we can trust you in him, that we can live lives that are led by your spirit, not by our sinful desires. And Lord, every day that's gonna be a challenge. And so I pray, Lord, that you every morning would wake us with a reminder to be connected to you, the giver of all of these great gifts, because ultimately they are who you are. So Father, may we be with you this morning. May we be encouraged by your word. May we encourage one another as we leave this morning, and may that be a testimony to this world that you are good. Amen. Now, I, I want to say right, right off the bat, when, whenever you're going through the scriptures and you come across lists like this, in the New Testament especially, in the, you know, the, the hypercritical, analytical culture that we live in today, it's very simple for us to say, okay, so here's the nine, the good list, and then here's the list of all the bad things that we're supposed to avoid. And as long as I don't do those things, then I'm okay. It, lists here, these are not exhaustive lists. This is not just like all of the things that come from being led by the Spirit. And those aren't all the things that happen when you're not led by the Spirit. That's important to remember. These, the lists change. Paul uses different things as he goes throughout the New Testament. He's just telling us there's a very clear way in what it looks like to follow God. And it's different, very different. The opposite of what it looks like to follow our own nature. So what does Paul mean by peace? In, in this text. Well, the Greek word that he's using appears over 90 times in the New Testament. And it really is the equivalent of the Hebrew word shalom, which is, happens over 230 times in the Old Testament. So over 300 times you've got this idea of peace in our Bibles. So it wasn't, it's not just important for us today, it was, it was very important for them as well. So it's very important for us to recognize this. I mean, when you find something that is in the Bible over 300 times, that's like pay attention. So I want to start by using the same method that Paul does in Galatians. And I want to contrast what peace isn't and what it is. And it gives us a good idea of where we tend to, you know, on the spectrum, we move towards not having peace, and then sometimes we experience peace, and it's just a good way to remind ourselves of what's happening in our, in our lives. Really, it's, again, the picture of being led by the Spirit versus kind of figuring things out on our own. So we'll start with this. Peace is not found in worry and anxiety. You say, duh, of course. Why, why, we all know that. Then why do we keep doing it? Peace is found in trusting God. And again, you look at that and you say, well, that's, that looks real simple there. But I'll tell you what, <laughs> we continually go to those places of worry and anxiety. Just because we know what to do doesn't mean that we're very good at actually doing it, actually resting in God and rejecting the anxiety and the worry that we work through in our lives. See, I think worry and anxiety are great examples of what it looks like not to trust God because they are, they're self-focused. Worry says, what can I do about this situation? What's my responsibility? How can I fix things? What, what, what can I do to alleviate this situation? Trusting God says, I have no control over this situation. And so I, I'm going to instead invest my energy, energy resting in whatever it is that God is doing in this circumstance. Rather than, than just trying to avoid it at all costs, which is what we do, instead you're saying, okay, in it, how am I going to rest, how am I gonna rest in God? French philosopher Michel de Montaigne, who's a 16th century philosopher, he said this. He said, my life has been filled with terrible misfortune, most of which never happened. <laughs> yeah, if you don't get that right away, it'll come to you later, okay? This is something every one of us does. <laughs> we live out these scenarios in our mind, and these things never actually end up coming true. Now, I, I will say this for Michel. He's a French philosopher. For, first of all, when I read philosophers back, going back to the 16th century, uh, 17th century, you know, all their pictures, are, they're so stoic. 
and they look like these guys, but you look at that guy's mustache, that has never gone out of style. <laughs> that mustache was popular in the 1500s. It was popular in the Wild West in the 1900s, and you probably could find a few in the room today, right? It's popular still today. What do you think about the neck ruffle? Can we bring that back? <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure. The mustache is here to stay. The neck ruffle, I don't know if that's coming back. And that, so you should look at that and say everything that we're wearing today, okay? A hundred years from now, people are going to look at that and be like, what were they thinking with the... Why didn't they wear neck ruffles? I mean, that's, that's what's in, right? So what does the scripture say about worry and anxiety? Jesus in John chapter 14 it says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. And if you know what's going on in this scenario, he's preparing his disciples for his eventual crucifixion and leaving. Bad things are going to happen to the disciples. They're not going to understand everything that's going to happen to them. And what does he say to them? He doesn't say, I want to make sure you understand everything that's going to happen and everything I'm going to do. He doesn't say that. He actually says the Spirit's going to come afterwards and help you understand what has just happened. No, he says, I want you to trust me in the same way that you trust God. In spite of your circumstances, you need to trust that I am with you and that I am good. Peter, in his letter, says this, cast all your anxiety on him, because he, Jesus, because he cares for you. Now, notice what Peter doesn't say that you shouldn't have or can't have anxiety. He just says, this is what you're to do with it, right? It's like hearing, in your anger, do not sin. You're going to have these emotions. It's what you do with them that matters. So instead of playing the what if game and, and all those scenarios out in, in your mind, you know, and, and let me say this too, that this is not pretending that bad things don't happen. Trusting God in the midst of your circumstances does not mean that you are pretending that bad things don't happen. And it doesn't mean that you're just, you know, sitting in the corner, serenity now, serenity now, so that, you, you know, you pretend like things are going to go away. That's not, I, I'm talking about taking all of your cares, your worries, your anxieties, everything that you stress over, and you take them to God. Because that is what the scripture tells us to do over and over and over again. It's not just because God has the answers. It's because he is the answer. It's not just what he gives you. It's his presence that ultimately is the source of peace. Robert Lee, he is an author. He wrote a book called The Worry Cure. And he says two things about worry that I want to mention. I didn't put on the screen because I actually don't really suggest reading the book. But there are two things he said in here that were really important. One, he says, worry gives you the illusion of control. I'm going to say that again. Worry gives you the illusion of control. And in essence, what he, he's saying is that when you worry, what you're trying to do is figure out all the plausible scenarios in your mind. Everything that could go wrong. And then, as if that wasn't bad enough, now you start trying to fix every single one of them in your head. Hypothetical solutions to hypothetical problems so you feel like you have control. I, look, I know I'm guilty. We're probably all guilty of doing this. But every time I play that game in my head and I, and I go through these scenarios, I, not once have I ever experienced peace. All it's done is brought up more questions and more questions. In, in Leahy's book, he, he's, he mentions a survey that says 85% of what we worry about never actually happens. Now, there are a few of you in here in this room that said, but there's 15% that does. <laughs> Again, we're not talking about circumstances here. We're talking about peace, no matter what our circumstances are. You say, well, you, look, you'd worry too if you know what I was going through. I'm telling you, bring it to God. Get on your knees and humbly ask the God of all creation 
to give you his peace, to take the worry away, not the circumstances, but the worry and the anxiety. The Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians reminds us, he says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, take them to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I mean, th this, this verse really is at the heart. I think, because as I, as I began with, peace is a very intangible thing. It's one of those things where you know when you have it, but you're not sure where to find it when you don't. And, and, and Paul recognizes that. This peace from God really is beyond our understanding, but it, it can be found primarily when we commit to being led by his spirit, being in his presence, more than listening to the counsel or the worries that keep bouncing around in our head. Now, we're, we're coming up, actually, I think it's the middle of August, we're coming up on the, the two-year anniversary of the Caldor fire that swept through here. And that is a picture afterwards. So... Almost 350 square miles burned in the Caldor fire. And so, and many of you who, who live here, you, you remember this going on. And I, I, but right before, I mean, the, the fire had happened before, before we got evacuation orders. My family and I, we traveled to the Central Coast, California. We were picking up a trailer, a travel trailer. And before we could get home, we got the call. The notification from El Dorado County that Christmas Valley, which is, was where I live, was under mandatory evacuation. And so we, we couldn't come home. Now, <clears throat> a couple things. First of all, we, 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 we had anticipated this might be a possibility before we left. So we, you know, grabbed some valuables. It, uh, it's interesting what you find is valuable in your home. When, when you think it's, it's not going to be there when you get back. I mean, we, we loaded family pictures, a, a hard drive, because it had family pictures on it. We, we, we have a family Bible from the 1800s that we took. And there's some other things that I had, you know, stored with family. But for the most part, I mean, it's just, what, what can you do? You can't take everything with you. And so, thankfully, we had this trailer, and so now we're, we're just living in this trailer, and we're watching from afar. We're watching on TV all of these people that don't live here driving through our neighborhoods and, you know, taking pictures of all of these things going on, and, and Christmas Valley became this big thing on the news. And we, we have a ring camera with ring doorbells, and so we had this live view from our, from our porch, you know, and we're watching, there's, you can see ash fly, and it's gray, and, um, you know, I, I can't remember, I can't remember exactly which day it was, uh, but we kept, you know, here, oh, it's, it'll stop here, and then it didn't. Oh, it'll stop here, and then it didn't. And whatever day it was, or afternoon, that that fire started cresting Echo Summit and, and coming down in, into Christmas Valley, I, I just remember, uh, I should be more worried than I am. And, and I wasn't. I... I just was, I, you know, I hate to use the cliche of just trusting God. I don't know what else to call it. I just knew that, hey, look, whatever happens is, is going to happen. And look, God gave us this home. It's an amazing miracle story for another day on how God gave us that home. And the reason that we live there is a gift from God. So if he wants to take that, okay, he'll give us something else. And, 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 I'm, and we're okay with that. And so uh, right before I went to bed, I remember that evening, our ring camera b went black. And, and that's, that's the power company shutting off the power because things are getting close. And we couldn't watch anymore. And I remember going to bed just thinking, ah, well, that's a bummer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I even had, a, uh, yeah, just, I tell you what, though, I slept. I slept great, I slept fine. I woke up to a text in the morning from a friend of mine. He said, I'm so sorry. And I thought, oh, that's the worst, right? Like, you, you know, um, but then I opened my computer and there was a guy who was following this with a heat map. And then I saw this. And I, 
if you don't know the area, that little strip in the middle where there's no red, that's Christmas Valley. And that's where our home was spared. I mean, it's amazing, again, it's a miracle from, from God that, that that happened. The point of the story is not that it's a miracle. The point of the story is there was nothing I could do about it. And so my peace was not in what was, I was going to wake up to. My peace was in the God who sustains me no matter what happens to my home. And how many years it's going to take for us to rebuild and where we're going to live. And all of those uncertainties were less important to me than knowing that, that God gave us this. He'll, he'll take care of us wherever he sends us. And, and what a gift from God that is. I mean, Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, he says, don't worry about your life. What you will eat or drink or what your bo- what, about your body or what you will wear is not life more than food and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And the answer to that question is no. No. And really at the heart of these verses is the idea of trust. Who are you going to trust? Is it going to be you that, that, that takes care of everything? Or are you going to trust that God is the one who's sustaining you throughout all of it? And one of my favorite stories about Jesus, and, you know, this is one of the most famous, is where Jesus, and I think I, we just talked about this. I don't know, Dan, you talked about this last week, but where Jesus is in the boat with his disciples, right? And the storm is going, and he's asleep. And they're freaking out because they're about to sink. It's in Mark Matthew 8, Mark 4, and Luke 8, all three of those tell this story. <laughs> and they wake him up and they say, aren't you, we're, aren't you afraid? We're going we're gonna to go down and we're going to die. And Jesus, cal- he calms the storm. That's the story, right? He calms the storm. And I, I tell you, what, I think it's a mistake to walk away from that story and, and say, Jesus wants to calm the storms in your life. I don't think that's the point of the story I think the point of the story is no matter what's going on, Jesus is in the boat with you, and he is far greater than the storm. So no matter what you're going through, if you have God with you, you can not just endure, but you can come out on the other end with growth that God wants us to have. You see, because peace, the peace that we're looking for is not going to be found in a life that is free from pain and suffering because that life does not exist. Peace is found in a person, and that person is Jesus. Peace is not something we produce. It doesn't come from our efforts of arranging all of our circumstances in the right way. Peace is something we receive from God. It is something by his very presence that God gives us. C.S. Lewis said this. He said, God cannot give us peace and happiness apart from himself because it is not there. There is temporary relief from circumstances. There is not peace deep down, which we all desire. And so when Paul uses this illustration of fruit, I mean, it's perfect because everybody can visualize exactly what he's talking about. Fruit does not exist on its own. Fruit is the product, the source of the tree. You take the fruit, you remove it from the tree, and what happens to it? It shrivels up and dies. It's a slow process, actually. Because the very life source of the fruit is the tree. It's the roots that are feeding the branches to which the fruit is connected to. And if you are not connected to the source, you will too be severed from everything that God wants to give you. This is the language that Jesus uses in John chapter 15, which again is a verse we are going to use continually throughout this series because it's true for every one of the fruit. Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. 
Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This, this is the point. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, that you are a product of what the tree, the very source of life that the tree offers. And when we do that, you show yourselves to be followers of Jesus, not of any other random thing, but of Christ. Now, I I understand the danger when we talk about intangibles like this, intangibles like peace, is that, you know, we say, look, if you have anxiety and you have worry, the the answer to this is the peace that comes from God. And it's a very intangible way, and it sounds nice on paper, but it's a lot harder to, to just find. I've heard a number of people tell me, just, look, I read my Bible, and I pray, and I still, I just can't find the peace of God. No matter what I do, I can't find it. And I, look, I get it. I, I understand that, that, you know, knowing where to find the peace isn't the same as having it. But sometimes the peace we're actually looking for is being removed from circumstances. And that's not what Jesus is talking about, or Paul. He's talking about having the peace of God in your circumstances, not from circumstances, in your circumstances. Uh, if, I've told a little bit of this story before, but thir- 13 years ago, my younger sister Lauren passed away uh, unexpectedly. And I was on a trip with about 20 students and youth leaders to Arizona for a Navajo missions trip, one we do every year. We were in Utah at the time camping. And so I, I get, in the evening, I get a phone call from my, from my mom, and she's just, she's sobbing. She's a, she's a wreck, and, and for good reason. And she tells me, look, you know, your sister just passed away, and it was under circumstances that, that were not expected by any means. And she said, you, you need to come home right now. And I thought, gosh, I know, but I can't. I got, I got 20 other people here that I'm leading, and we're in day two of a 10-day missions trip. We're not even there yet. I, I, can't, I can't turn it, turn it around right now. And we talked for a while on the phone, and then after I, I hung up, I remember I went into my tent by myself, and I just started sobbing. And I don't know, I don't know for how long, probably 15 minutes, I just sobbing in my tent. It was sad. It's a tragic thing. And I opened, I opened my Bible to the Psalms. It's, it's what I do when I want to be in the presence of God. I, I go to the Psalms. I, as, as someone who, who studies the Bible to, to teach it, um, and at, there are other places where I read and I get distracted by word studies and these other things. And, and it, it's good in the long run for me and being fed, but in the short term, it's, it's, it's more of a you know, learning process. When I just want to rest in God, I go to the Psalms. And I can't tell you which psalm I turn to, I, but I know after about 10 minutes of just sitting and praying and, and reading the psalms, I felt the most absolute calmness come over me in, in a way that I have never experienced in my life. It wasn't waking up and finding out that my house had been passed over. It was knowing my sister wasn't going to come back until I get to see her again in glory. And any of you who've lost a family member, especially, you know, a a child, that, that pain, you understand, it comes and goes. It never goes away. It ebbs and flows. But, but God was with me in that moment where he gave me such peace that I felt Later, I just, I felt this extreme amount of guilt. Like I, should, I shouldn't have this peace. And I was reminded very clearly <laughs> from God. Hey, buddy, 
I'm, I'm, I'm giving this to you and I want you to rest in me. Everything is going to be okay. Yes, there'll be pain down the road, but it's going to be okay because I'm going to be with you through all of it. And so I, and I went to Arizona and continued the trip. It was a very good, fruitful trip, missions. And then went and spent time with my family when, when I got home and got to be with my mom at that time. See, I share that story because I, I don't want us to get tricked into thinking that peace just comes when the story ends well. P- peace comes if we choose to be connected to the source of that peace, no matter what we're going through. See, I can't explain what I experienced that day in any other way than this. It was a peace that came from God that I do not understand, but I can tell you as clear as day, I had it. And I'm grateful to God for it. And I'll tell you, my mom is grateful because I know that she has said she doesn't know how a parent would go through losing a child without having Christ. I know she's been an encouragement to other families who've experienced the same thing that we have. Sometimes God allows us to go through these things so that we can come alongside others in their grief. And the last thing I want to mention today is the potential of what this fruit of peace has in our lives. What can God do if we truly receive that peace from him. See, when we have peace with God and that leads to peace within ourselves, we can share that peace with others. That's what I just talked about in my mom being a resource for other parents going through that. If I have peace with God, I have peace to share. See, that, that's the irony. We all share what we have. If you're a bitter person, you share bitterness with the people around you. If you are a jealous person, You share jealousy with the people around you. However, being led by the Spirit, you can also be a person who shares love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and self-control. All of these things, if you're being led by the Spirit, you get to be someone who shares these things with others. Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 said this, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Who are peacemakers? people who have peace and then can share it with others. Now, that word blessed can be translated happy and also peaceful. Doesn't sound very good in English to say peaceful are the peacemakers. It's the same concept. They will be content. They will be full at peace with God and at peace with themselves. See, when you're deeply connected to God, and I know this is something that comes and goes for all of us, but when you are deeply connected to him, you realize that the peace you're experiencing is not just about yourself. It's about being a conduit of the grace God has given you so that through you, you can share those gifts with other people. You don't just keep it for yourself. You keep it get to be the one who takes that gift and shares it with other people. See, that's when you become a peacemaker. James, the brother of Jesus, said this, peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. God is the one producing the fruit. You get to be the conduit to which he does that with. See, when God uses the spirit in us, to speak to other people, to produce fruit in their lives. I mean, gosh, that is one of the most beautiful pictures of the kingdom of God I've ever seen. People loving God so much that they are free to love others no matter what their circumstances are. Up, down, sideways, whatever it is, they are taking the things God has given them and they are sharing them with other people. I... You know, I'm trying to think about just one of the ways that, that we experience this joy. And have you, have you ever brought a piece of a barrel, basket, whatever, of fruit home from like the farmer's market? Or if you're, you know, down in the Central Valley, California, you're driving maybe 99 and you see a fruit stand on the side of the road in front of the orchard, in front of the orchard? Stop. If, get fruit from those guys because it came right from there generally. 
Have you ever had fruit that's just so amazing? You bring it home and it, it's just so good you want to share it. You just want to share it with your friends. You're like, you've got to come over and have this. Okay, that response leads me to believe you're a bunch of fruit hoarders out here. <laughs> I know our fruit is terrible up here. So you get good fruit, you're like, no, I'm not sharing that with anybody. The, the, the joy of saying this is so good, I want to share it with others, is what God wants us to experience in his peace. So that we would take his peace like it was an amazing piece of fruit and share it with other people. See, we live in a world that is, that is so filled with anxiety and worry. And what are they trying to do? They're trying to avoid circumstances that make them uncomfortable. They're trying to pretend that reality doesn't exist and therefore they cannot experience that discomfort in their lives and they create an alternate reality. Or they're numbing themselves with pleasure and experience, trying to avoid the pain in their life. And I'll tell you, none of that stuff lasts. I'm, I'm about to turn 50 years old and I love hiking. I love being outside. I, I grew up surfing and skateboarding and I'm realizing those things are not gonna be a part of my life forever. I, I'm not gonna be able to find peace on the top of Talak because I'm not gonna be able to get up there. <laughs> so I'm gonna have to figure out how to do it some other way. And that other way is knowing that I have peace with God in Jesus Christ. And because of that, I have his peace. And because I have his peace, I can share it with others. Yes. So may we, the people of God, the family of God, be peacemakers because we are connected to the source of all peace. Our Lord, our Savior, our Creator, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, what a gift it is to have your spirit, to have you. And, and I want to, I just want to remember that you are not a convenience store, God, that I run to when I need things. You are the very presence I desire in every moment of my life. To know you no matter where I'm at or what I'm doing. That I would be so closely connected to the branches of the tree and the roots that feed me. Father, I would have enough to share. Thank you for leading us, for guiding us, for sending your spirit, Lord. And I pray that today, Father, we would trust you. We would reject the anxiety and the worry that plagues our minds. And instead, we would just sit in your presence and rest in you. May we have the peace that surpasses all understanding so that we may point other people to the source of that peace. And that is you, Jesus. I pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. All right. We do have uh, just a reminder back at the bench table back there. We're printing out some resources that go along with the study. So there are verses on peace, bookmarks, stickers. It's all free. Go back. Help yourself to that. We're going to have our ushers come forward, continue our worship with our offering now. I do want to tell you as well, guys, there's a discussion group that happens in the conference room only after this service. So if you want to go upstairs and really work through this scripture more, then you can do that after this service. And don't forget to pray for our crew students this summer. Thanks for being here this summer, guys. Have a great day. Corbett shared and um, this last song is just it's called your will be done and that's really where we receive God's peace is when we just say okay God whatever whatever may come you know I'm gonna just let you do what you need to do and just help us to rest in that so let's stand let's just lay that before the Lord as we uh, just think about what we learned just now
Continue on in that mindset of just laying it down before the Lord. Have a blessed week, everyone. We'll see you again next Sunday. And in this name, we over.